All right, everybody's here and they're ready to sing out, aren't they? Y'all, y'all try to forget what happened this morning, okay? <laughs> but Mr. H. B. and me had a conversation about that a while ago. But uh, sometimes I think you know them, and sometimes you don't. Sometimes I feel like a nut, and sometimes I don't. But uh, but y'all did good trying, really. And, uh, but we, we have a good time no matter what, don't we? As long as it's in the Lord and it's bringing glory and praise to Him, that's all that matters. And that's what we'll do now is praise Him, praise Him. Page number 164. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus bless Him. Thank you so much for being here in our evening service. We trust you've had a good day and we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Just a reminder of the uh, prayer requests that I mentioned this morning. Remember Brother Willis, also Erica Jones, uh, the young lady who's recovering from uh, lung surgery. And then also I know that there's several special prayer requests that uh, people have on the heart that maybe they don't have on the uh, prayer list, but let's uh, especially remember them. And uh, let's remember our service tonight. And Brother Easley, would you lead us please? That's why we come here today to lift you up. And we pray our time tonight will be a time of seeking you and hearing your word and responding, working our hearts to be receptive. And we do pray for these ones that are really sick. This Erica Jones and others, many you mentioned. I don't know them all, but we lift them up to you and pray that your healing hand would be with them. Some are discouraged, some have lost loved ones, and we pray for comfort for them. And we just commit our service into your hands and care. And our goal is to magnify you and exalt your name together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I do appreciate you being in our service. I also appreciate those who are listening online. And, uh, and who will be listening online. We know that there's a lot of folks that listen after the fact, but we appreciate 
the faithfulness there. But just a couple of reminders as far as announcements are con concerned. Remember, Sister Brenda will be here on the 28th on that Sunday morning, so I know you'll be looking forward to visiting her and seeing her, and she'll be singing for us. And then also remember uh, this uh, this evening in our offering, remember it is Beam Sunday, so keep that in mind. And also remember the Robin Wood Ministry uh, every Monday at 3 o'clock. But uh, it is good to see you. I hope you've had a good day. And uh, now I'll turn things back over to Brother Jim. Brother Jim. There's a line that's been drawn through the ages. On that line stands an old rugged cross. On that cross a battle is raging for the gain of a man's soul or its loss. On one side march the forces of evil, all the demons and devils of With the force of the conflict And the sun refuses to shine For there hangs God's Son in the balance And then through the darkness he cries it is finished, the battle is over. It is finished, there'll be no more war. It is finished, the end of the conflict. It is finished, and Jesus is Lord, yet in my heart the battle was raging, not all prisoners of war had come home, these were battlefields of my own making. I didn't know that the war had been won. Then I heard that the king of the ages had fought all my battles for me. And victory was mine for the claiming and now praise his name i am free it is finished the battle is over it is finished there'll be no Jesus is Lord, it is finished, and Jesus is Run 
not a something to do, take up an offering. How's that? Let's all stand to our feet. Let's shake hands for a few minutes before we do. Whenever Charlene gets back over, we're going to let HB do a solo. How's that? <laughs> yeah, we're going to uh, uh, let everybody shake hands maybe after the offerings took. How's that? We'll change it around a little bit, do something different. All right. Clarence, would you bless the offering for us? <clears throat> Amen. Page 162 in your book. Page 162. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So Second verse, here we go. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest of sister to come up here, grab a mic, and she's going to have to lead the same. She didn't know this was going to happen. <laughs> As you can tell, I think what I'm told. Ain't got nothing to do with But uh, I like singing with my sister. All right, last verse, everybody. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus will 
Pray for Brenda Westman. She had a back go out on us this week, and she's supposed to sing tonight. And we miss her, and we can't replace her. But I hope you can put up with us again, okay? <laughs> We're going to do one that Virginia, Charlene's mother, asked us to do many years ago. And we thought we'd try to do it for her tonight. Bear in mind, we ain't practiced this thing, so y'all might be in for it. All right, but we like the song and we all know it, so we hope it's a blessing to you. The love of God is greater for. Y'all messed up the first thing, didn't we? All right. Start it over. Now, did I mess up or did y'all mess up coming in? <laughs> Fierce. <laughs> All right. I'm going to watch you and let you show me how to do it. Huh? Is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest end. A guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win his erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin oh love of God how rich and good how measureless and strong it shall
was good in spite of the fact that Jim messed it up. That's okay. <laughs> good to see everybody this evening. I hope everybody's had a good day this evening and good to uh, see everybody. It looks like summertime has got here. A uh, nice warm day today. So we give thanks to the Lord for that. Uh, turn, if you would, this evening in your Bibles to book of Psalm chapter 104. Uh, Psalm chapter 104. I want to have us to look at one verse this evening, and uh, this will be the uh, one verse primarily that I'll be using, uh, preaching from here tonight for uh, my, my sermon topic, which is namely a lesson on grass. A lesson on grass. Notice verse 14, Psalm 104. The Bible says he causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb, for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. So again, you will notice the Bible says that it's God that causeth the grass to grow. Then, in, of course, in this verse, he mentions uh, the reason for that. Let's have prayer. Father, thank you this evening for this uh, another opportunity to be in this service and for the opportunity this evening again to uh, consider together your precious word. Thank you tonight for all of those that have a part in this service, whether it be here in the auditorium or whether it be those that are viewing. Now this evening, Lord, I just would pray that uh, you'll open our understanding uh, that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law as uh, the psalmist said. Lord, help us tonight to draw from this passage uh, that which uh, we need to hear and uh, will help us. Now, Lord, this evening meet all needs, whatever they might be tonight, and Lord, we'll thank you this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, tonight I've entitled my message, A Lesson on Grass. Actually, uh, when you stop and think about it, everything in life, uh, we could say, has a lesson. We can learn from just about anything. We can learn from object lessons. We can learn from life's experiences. We can learn from uh, aspects of creation. And namely, this is one of them right here. So tonight there is something to be learned from a blade of grass. I guess tonight I could call this um, um, keeping in, uh, in, in keeping with uh, theological jargon. I can maybe call this grassology, maybe. <clears throat> now don't be looking, trying to find that word in the uh, dictionary or anywhere, you'll not find it. But uh, I'm naming it that for the sake of this lesson this evening, grassology or a lesson on grass. Now, I'll begin in a very practical way since we have already got into the mowing season and since grass is already beginning to grow and we've already had the privilege to uh, ride a lawnmower across our lawn a few times already. So uh, I will uh, present it tonight from uh, this line of thinking. Uh, I want to give you something to think about the next time you crawl on your mower. Now, I'm scheduled to be on mine tomorrow sometime. And so the next time you get on your mower, I'm going to give you food for thought, something to think about. We see here in verse 104, uh, the verse, or 14 I meant to say, we see here in this verse that it's God that causes the grass to grow. Then you will notice in this verse of scripture, it says that not only does God cause the grass, the, the grass to grow, but he does that for a reason, for the cattle, for the herb, for the service of man, that he may bring food out of the earth. So God's hand is upon even a blade of grass. That is truly amazing when you stop and think about that. God's hand is even on a blade of grass. Now, some of you may or may not remember the, uh, the, the laws, uh, various laws that have uh, uh, scientists sometimes have referred to the, uh, and, and so forth. One of them is simply the scientific law of cause and effect. Scientific laws of cause and effect. In other words, for every effect, there's a cause. And, uh, you know, we can say tonight that that can certainly be brought out, can be borne out to be true. For every effect, there is a cause. Now, creation itself is a result of 
his creation. Creation is here because of him. He is the creator. Uh, the, the results of his doing is creation itself. Now, there's a lot of arguments we could use tonight concerning the scientific law of cause and effect. One such principle that we could refer to is simply this. Human beings have intelligence. We have intelligence. So that argues for something else. That proves there must be a greater intelligence. For us tonight who believe in creation, believing that God's sovereign power is behind it all, then if we consider human beings, the anatomy of human beings, the ability to think, the intelligence of human beings, then that would argue as we think about cause and effect, then there has to be a cause for that. Why are we like we are? Why do we, of all of God's creation, why is it that human beings are the, are the only ones that, uh, of living creations that uh, prevail, that uh, have intelligence as we do, uh, that would be the cream of God's crop of creation, so to speak? So, the intelligence of human beings argues for an intelligence greater than ourselves. Now, the law, you've probably heard this, and not that I'm trying to be uh, scientific tonight at all, but sometimes you can't illustrate points by referencing uh, uh, laws of science, the laws of thermodynamics. Thir the first law of thermodynamics says this, and I know this doesn't interest you right now. This is really a, not a best time in the world to try to uh, you know, get into something like this, especially evening time, and when people, a lot of y'all didn't even get your nap to start with, and Sunday evening sometimes is not the easiest to concentrate. I understand that. But, uh, but there's something we can learn here. Now, the first law of thermodynamics is this. Matter can be changed, but can neither be created nor destroyed. It had to have an original cause. Matter can be changed, but it had an original cause. So now, uh, it goes back to God, doesn't it? Basically, when you stop and think about it, when we think of matter, something that occupies space, matter, can't remember exactly the definition of matter uh, when I took science years ago, but uh, it has to do with uh, uh, an object or, or, or something uh, occupies place and time, I, something else there, but you know, you know, that's not that important. But now matter itself had to have a cause. You and I can go out here, we can take a piece of lumber, we can take several pieces of lumber, we can build a house. But where did the lumber come from? It came from the tree. So now it still would go back to God. There had to be an original cause. Now the second law of thermodynamics means that things run down. It has to do with things running down. I'm thinking of Psalm 102 that says, Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. Now that particular law says that basically things run down, things go down, things uh, deteriorate, we, we could say. Creation verifies the workings of God. It verifies the existence and power of God. We are creationists. We believe that God is the divine creator. Now, when it comes to revelation, uh, theologians talk about natural revelation and spatial revelation. Natural revelation is simply, uh, let's say, uh, creation itself. That's a natural revelation, revealing God, natural creation. Spatial revelation is the Bible, God's precious word. It pertains to the Bible itself. Now, coming back tonight to my topic, what can be learned from a simple blade of grass, though. That's what we're looking at, a simple blade of grass. It is truly amazing to see that 
nothing in life is insignificant when it's seen in the context of God. Nothing is insignificant. Jesus once said this. He said, consider the lilies, didn't he? Consider the lilies. In uh, Matthew chapter 6 it says, consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. So there's a lesson to be learned from the lilies. Well, again, there's a lesson to be learned from a blade of grass. What about the grass? How important is the grass? Well, we tend sometimes, if we get tired of mowing it, uh, we tend to think that we'd, we'd prefer having a yard that didn't have grass maybe sometime, or uh, maybe uh, sell out and move to the city and have nothing but pavement all around you. Uh, so sometimes we kind of resent grass because it, 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 it spells work oftentimes for us. But what about the grass? In the context here, God gives grass for food. He gives grass for food. And I want to say tonight, there's food for thought. Not only does he give grass for food, but there's food for thought in grass. And that's what we're saying. I want to mention three things that uh, grass reminds us of. I'm telling you, friends, you don't have to look far to find a good illustration on God, do you? Well, the existence of God, you don't. I mean, life is full of illustrations. First of all, here's a thought. The lesson from grass. All right, a point is this. Grass, the food for thought that I see in grass is it teaches the lesson on the frailty of life. The frailty of life. The Bible says in Psalm 103, 15, as for man, his days are as grass. Interesting, isn't it? As grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. His days are as grass. Now, what a thought. The frailty of life. The grass grows, is cut down very soon, doesn't last long at all, and he takes that, he runs with it, the psalmist does, and he says that's just like man's days. Just like grass. Just like the flower of the field. A lesson on the frailty of human life. I don't think I need to hammer home that point too much tonight because every single one of us are aware of the fact that life is frail. We, uh, some of us now that uh, have lived several years upon this earth, we look back and many times find ourselves wondering where has time going? I mean, is it amazing when you're uh, in the prime of life, when you're, when you're young and when you get a little bit older even, you don't give a whole lot of thought to, uh, to mortality. Uh, it's all about living. It's all about uh, career. It's all about work. It's all about education. It's all about different other things. And people do not give a whole lot of consideration when they're young to mortality, to the frailty of life, to the brevity of life. I remember when I was a little kid years ago in West Virginia, I remember there was up on, up on a hill, there was a cemetery, and I probably was maybe seven or eight years old, and I can remember seeing that uh, procession on the top of that hill, transporting that uh, body over to the grave, and I was a little kid, and I was staring up there, and I was thinking, and uh, it, it, even, it bothered me a little bit then, because even in my young mind, it still shocked me into reality that people die. But now that I'm my age, and I look back, it's almost like you wake up one morning and you look and you, you, get, you look at a mirror and you say, what in the world happened to you? It's, it's scary. I mean, it just seems like the older you get that a year is reduced. You know, it seems like a 12-month a, a yearly segment goes by like it's only like six months. It goes so quickly. So time is passing so quickly, and you, you realize this more when you get older. So the frailty of human life, 
Now there's a good Bible illustration found in Psalm 104 verse 26. And uh, the illustration there is uh, concerning uh, the ship. All right, look at verse 26. There go the ships. <laughs> it's an interesting statement, isn't it? There go the ships. In other words, the point that we can draw from that is the ships are soon out of sight. They load up with their cargo or whatever the type of vessel it might be, and they soon are out of sight. Again, indicative of the frailty of human life. So now we look at grass. Coming back to this simple object lesson tonight, a blade of grass. We see a picture of the frailty of human life. Secondly, we see a picture of the frailty of the futility, the futility of the wicked. Not only the frailty of human life, but the futility of the wicked. It says it will soon be cut down. It will soon be cut down. There's a suggestive thought there. There's a thought there of the futility of the wicked. Soon to be cut down. Grass grows, but in no time it has to cut, be cut. It has to be cut. I know I touched on this a little bit this morning, but it's like sinners. It's like unsaved people. They strut around like they're going to live forever, but, but yet like grass, they're soon to be mowed down. Uh, they, they, they act like they really have it all under control and they're in charge of their own lives and little do they realize that they are frail. Uh, those that go through life fighting God, as I said this morning, they always lose and their defeat isn't reserved just to the end of their lives. Their defeat takes place during the course of their life. Any person that fights against God suffers immediately. You don't have to die to suffer. We suffer immediately. You cannot find a happy, contented, joyful person who is fighting God. You cannot. None of them are happy. They are resentful. Many times they are bitter. It, you just can see it in their countenance. No one wins fighting God. No one. They tend to self-destruct along the way. They try shortcuts many times to mask their misery and in the process sometimes uh, they hasten uh, their death. They hasten their death. We're living in a time where drug and alcohol abuse is at an epidemic proportion, especially drug abuse. It is awful. It is awful. But now Psalm 37 says this, verses one and two, and I'm gonna read it. It says, fret not thyself because of evildoers, Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they soon, note this, shall be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. That's 37, one and two. We see the futility of the wicked. Grass reminds us tonight of the futility of the wicked. So there's a lesson on the frailty of life there's a lesson on the futility of the wicked, but thirdly, there's a lesson on the fortunes of the righteous. And I'll explain it. The fortunes of the righteous. Now here's a thought. Uh, Isaiah 44, verses three and four. He says this, for I'll pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. That's Isaiah 44. I believe that grass tonight can at least remind us of the fortunes of the righteous. Now friend, this evening, I'm not talking about here necessarily. I'm not talking about now. I'm not talking about materialism. I'm not talking about money. The, the, the prophet here is focused upon a time that's coming upon this earth that the righteous will truly flourish. He is prophesying a time uh, that Christ will be ruling and productivity will be, uh, will, will be maxing out the land will be producing. 
I mean, agriculture, try to think about this for a moment. Try to imagine agriculture during the millennium. You're talking about crops, productivity. I mean, you know, read, go over there and read some, sometime get over and read Isaiah 44, read that. What a wonderful time there will be. But grass would somewhat illustrate the uh, fortunes of the righteous, the coming days upon this earth when God will favor his people with the fortunes of his blessing. And here's a point, as abundant as the grass. And most of us know that grass is pretty abundant. Blessings of God will be as abundant as the grass during the millennium. You know, I tell you what, we've got a pretty good future, friend. We've got a pretty good future. We have a whole lot of things right now to cause us to frown when we look outward and see what's going on in this world today, but we have a whole lot to make us smile when we look ahead and know that one day God's people are gonna be perfectly happy, perfectly happy. So the grass speaks of the frailty of life it speaks of the futility of the wicked. It speaks of the fortunes of the righteous. And then, fourthly, the blade of grass speaks of the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. Because again now, it says this, he causes the grass to grow. The faithfulness of God. God is faithful to provide. God is faithful to provide what is needed in the realm of creation to keep the ecosystem rolling. He gives a grass to feed the cattle. He gives a cattle to feed us. I mean, it's just the cycle. God is faithful. Uh, you, today, you hear all kinds of uh, uh, panic attacks going on uh, people today that think the world's on a, uh, running down, running out of energy, and uh, if we wait much longer, uh, the sun is going to penetrate through the ozone layer. We're all going to be scorched to death, or uh, and the environmental quacks uh, pushing their panic panic buttons, saying that all of this oil and stuff that we're using is poisoning. Uh, the rivers and the streams and the earth and all that stuff. And I mean, they're just trying to work everybody up to a frenzy. And I would like to ask them tonight, of course, I, kn I know the answer. They don't have an answer. I'd like to say to them tonight, where's God in all this? Don't you think the watchmaker, using that illustration, we this evening have a watch on our hands or pocket or somewhere. This watch didn't just come into being by itself, did it? There's a watchmaker. And if this watch messes up, and this right here now, this is, this is a citizen watch that I'm wearing. Uh, it might be another one of those throwaway, throwaway versions. I, I don't know. I think that my, possibly I could get this one fixed. But I'm just saying now, if you have a jeweled watch, a good watch, and it breaks down, who do you take it to? You don't take it to an auto mechanic. You don't take it to an astronaut. You don't take it to a doctor. You take it to a watchmaker. And I'm just of the old fashioned opinion tonight, the one that created this earth knows how to take care of it. The environmentalists and all those people can push your panic buttons all they want to, but I believe that God not only created the earth, but God has dressed the earth. God has pr produced uh, under on the earth, and, and, and the Lord, in other words, the Lord upkeeps the earth. It's in his hands. The faithfulness of God. A little blade of grass reminds me of the faithfulness of God. That grass calls an effect. It's there for reason. There's nothing accidentally upon this earth when we see it from through the prism of a creator God. Everything has purpose. It's not winding down. It's upheld. Colossians. 
by him all things consist. He is before all things. By him all things consist. Consist. The word consist has the thought of cohesive, cohesiveness. In other words, he holds it together. Uh, he is a creator. By him all things are created and all things consist or are held together. He not only creates, but he holds together. Everything has purpose. A blade of grass even says God's faithful. And then, you're talking about a good thought now on the faithfulness of God. I believe the blade of grass itself argues for the faithfulness of God with purpose. What about this? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Now take that and run with it. Green pastures. Pastures of grass. Everything has order. Even grass itself is significant. Have you ever gone out in a field? Or I'm talking about, or, or let's say on a grass lawn and just lay down on the grass and sense even somewhat of the comfort of laying on that grass. I mean, it's a whole lot more comfortable than laying, going out and laying on the on a, on a pavement or on a road somewhere, isn't it? Lie down in green pastures. Do you know I've taken some naps down through the years laying on, 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 on grass, or out, you know, like out in fields or whatever. Have you ever taken a nap out in the open on the grass? I have many a time. So, see, God's faithful. That lets us know tonight that God even gives us a natural bed to sleep on. He maketh me, that's rest, lie down green pastures. Through God provides grass for the cattle, God provide, provides cattle for us to eat. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we make a, a parallel uh, here, is provided also as food for our soul, but we must by faith receive and feed upon him. Now, he causes the grass to grow right here Grace, uh, grace does not grow in the heart without a divine cause either. If God cares to make the grass grow, he'll also make us, he also can help us grow in grace. See, he's behind it all, isn't he? So you know, grassology is not a bad study. The study on the frailty of life, the study on the futility of the wicked, the study on the fortunes of the righteous and the study on the faithfulness of God. I love to just simply sometimes, and I did this this past week, I love to do a study. I love to take one verse and I love to see what I can do with it with a poem from time to time. And you may have seen this. We posted this. But I thought about this. He made the stars to shine above and made the planet earth. He causes blades of grass to grow up from the fields of dirt. He sees a tiny sparrow when it falls to the ground. He also sees his children wherever they are found. His hands are strong and mighty. In his strength we can depend. His heart is ever loving and his mercy will not end. He feeds a herd of cattle when he makes the grass to grow, he also feeds his people this lesson we can know. The simple blade of flimsy grass contains a wondrous truth. The God of all creation even made its tiny root. You know that's true? I believe the same hands that stretched space into existence is the same hand that created the tiny root of a blade of grass. God's behind it all. It's a thrilling truth tonight to know that this world is not as much out of control 
as the uh, natural man would have us think, but it's very much in control, and God is on the throne tonight. What a blessing this evening to know the Creator, but to know Him as Savior. What a blessing tonight. Yes, you can learn a lot from a little blade of grass, grassology. Let's pray. Father, thank you this evening for this simple, brief study of a simple, practical verse. And this evening, may it be an encouragement to all of our hearts. May we learn a lesson from even that little blade of grass. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We will have an invitation this evening if maybe God has nudged some heart tonight in this building and you sense the need this evening of coming to an altar, uh, talking to the